Hello, good evening and welcome officially to Pixelmator Photo for iPad. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Elaine Giles, long-time podcast host, trainer and all-round inveterate geek, as I like to think about it. Uh, tonight, I'm looking at Pixelmator Photo, which is brand new. It has only been out just over 24 hours. I was on the beta program, so I've been using it for a good while now. Uh, the one I'm showing you tonight is actually the one that you can get your hands on right now in the App Store. So I'm not using anything that you can't use straight away. But as I've been saying in the chat that we've been having before I officially started, the most important job I've got to do first before we even look at this is I need to manage your expectations about what this is. <laughs> right. We know it's an app. It's iPad only. And we know it's for editing photos. And some of you will fall in love with it. Seriously, it will be what you have always wanted to edit your photos in. If you actually look at some of the reviews in the App Store, some people are saying that they're loving it. Um, they're giving you examples of why they love it, what the features are that it's got that's important to them. But you'll notice even some people who are saying, well, I like it. There's all, there seems to be a, a few buts, basically. Um, not intending for you to read all of these. I'll just talk over them. But basically, there are people who are loving it. Obviously, it does what they want it to do. However, it might not be what you were either expecting or looking for. You could be left feeling more than a little disappointed, especially if your favourite feature is missing. And in that regard, you wouldn't be alone. Again, if we look at some of these reviews, it's what the complaint here is, it's, it's not got all the features I want. Well, the thing is, it's not intended to be the original Pixelmator for iPad, nor Pixelmator Pro for iPad. It's a completely new concept for iPad. Now, even the reviews that are complaining are saying, well, the interface is nice. Um, having said that, some people don't like the icon. <laughs> and others are finding that it's crashing as well. So just Having a think about all of that, what I'd say to you is it's Marmite. You are either going to love this or loathe it. But let's try and decide what it actually is. Now, Pixelmator for desktops has been around for a long, long time. This isn't that. It's not Pixelmator for iPad, the full version, the one you're used to on the desktop. Not that. There's also been Pixelmator Pro on the desktop. This is not the iPad version of that either. You are doubtless familiar with Photoshop and you have pre preconceptions of what that actually is and what that does. And this isn't that either. Many, many of you will have tried Affinity Photo, both on the desktop and for iPad. It's not that either. <laughs> so at this point, you're thinking, what on earth? The nearest I, I can say to you is Snapseed. With Snapseed, if you think about what that one can do, you'd be much closer to what this one can do. Obviously, the benefit of Snapseed is it has an iPhone version. And Pixelmator Photo doesn't, but it is built from the ground up and the focus has been on the most frequently used and needed tools. As I've said, it's iPad only, but even within the range of iPads that are available, which gets more confusing every time they release one. This is what you're going to need at a minimum. Now, it's not as complicated as it looks. A 9.7 inch iPad Pro is the latest version of the, the 9.7 inch iPad Pro. I nearly said the smallest iPad then, but that would be wrong because there's an iPad mini and it doesn't work on that full stop. Now, standard iPads, these would be 9.7 inch, but not the pro versions. You're going to need at least the fifth or sixth generation. You'll notice there the iPad Airs are missing. That's because Apple refused to distinguish between them. And although technically an iPad Air 2 is powerful enough to run it, an iPad Air 1 isn't. And it's either both or neither. So they've had to go for neither. The 10.5 inch iPad Pro 6th gen supports it. And then we come on to the iPad Pros that are current models. So the 11 inch and the iPad Pro 1st, 2nd and 3rd gen. So if you've got the biggest iPad, but it's the oldest one, it's OK. It runs on that. 
What I'm using tonight is the 11 inch, purely because it's my newest iPad. I've also got a lot of stuff on the desk, which I'll show you because I've got a camera on there. So you'll see why I've not gone for the biggest iPad. So I'm going to be running it on 11 inch. Now, it's available right now in the store. I've had a quick chat with some of you and I know you've already got it. If you want to go and get it now and have a look at it while, while I'm working through it, there's a link there, which is very simple, egiles.me Pixelmator photo. Just use that link. It will open up in a browser and from there you it will take you to the store and you can download and install it. And it is $4.99 in pounds and dollars. So that's it for the positioning. I thought it was important to get that out of the way. I probably lost people already. It's like, no, that's not for me. And that's fine. That's fine. But if you've already bought it and you think, hmm, if I'd known, well, let me show you what it can do and, sh and show you what it can do incredibly well. Let's go and have a look at that. Right. First thing I'm going to do is uh, go and have a look, see if there's any, any questions here. Um... <laughs> Has my accent changed? Does it really? I think I think I probably speak slower. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> right. Uh, a lighter version of Lightroom. Lightroom. The distinction between this and Lightroom is. Lightroom, I like to think of as, as for handling multiple images. And this is, I would say, focused on single images at the moment. And what about the new iPad Air 2019? If it's brand new, it should be OK. Uh, and what about the iPad mini 2? No, it does not work on the iPad mini full stop. I'm imagining that's an interface thing. Let me show you the interface and you'll get an idea for why it doesn't work on the mini. Right. OK, so what we're seeing on here is my iPad. and We'll be seeing it twice. We're going to see my iPad in stereo. So let me bring this on and show you what, what how I'll be demonstrating it. Right. I'm reflecting the screen of my iPad. This is my working iPad, as you can see. And that's on the left hand side. And this down here on the right hand side in the corner. Let me move it up a bit because I know I've got a watermark over that, which won't help matters. Right. That's the camera that's on my desk. So as I said, I promised you show you everything that's on my desk. Here's my, my notes and my running order. And there's um, another my phone and my keyboard, iPad, pencil, we'll be using that. Spare microphone, um, other microphone. This is what I'm talking into. So you can see I've got a lot of stuff on my desk and that's why I'm not using the biggest iPad I've got. So I'm not going to have room to move. Now, uh, I probably, first caveat, I'm probably not going to be as accurate as I would like to be because I'm not intending to move the iPad. I'm intending to leave it on the desk so you guys can see what I'm doing. I'm showing you this one down here with my hand so you can see where my hand actually is when I'm working. I would suggest I'll try and talk it through as well. I'd suggest you keep your eye over on the left. And I've got to remember not to use the mouse and try and interact with the iPad because it doesn't work like that. I just like to think it does. Right. So there it is. And now when you go into it, it takes you into this view. And this is the first big difference. Now, you'll see here I've got images and they're in twos because I've had to play around with them. <laughs> and this is what happens. So the first view that you will see is Pixelmator Photo Recents. I found this quite strange and you may have experienced this if you've already tried it. What I saw in here when I very first opened it the very first time was images that I had not opened in Pixelmator Photo at all. But what I had done, I had opened them that day. So before I went in a couple of hours ago and just whipped through these images, I had images in here of dogs and stuff that people had sent me today. So although it says Pixelmator Photo Recents, actually it's broader than that. So that's the recents that you have over on the left hand side at the bottom so that you've got two buttons at the bottom, recent on the left and browse on the right. So that's what that's actually showing you. And these are images now that I have opened and edited today in Pixelmator Photo. Over on the right on the browse, that actually takes you through to a view that you may be familiar with from the files app. So everybody's view of this is going to be slightly different. On the left hand side, you're going to see locations, but your locations will be different to my locations. How I organise mine, and I don't know why Amazon Drive's moved. 
that should be higher up. Um, I have the locations in the order that I'm likely to use them. So I have my iCloud driver at the top, followed by my Google Drive. Google Drive is my primary cloud service, but not everything works with it as seamlessly as it does iCloud. So I have iCloud at the top. File Browser is an app on my iPad, as is Yoink, Dev and Think to Go, and PDF Expert. So they are file providers, but they're not cloud services. They're on my iPad. Obviously, Dropbox and Box, they're other cloud services, as is Amazon Drive. I tend to have, which is why I'm, I'm a bit confused as to why it's moved, I tend to have on my iPad at the bottom because I don't really want to store anything on my iPad. If I store stuff, stuff on my iPad and my iPad dies a sad death, my stuff goes with it. So I try and keep it away from that into a cloud service. But that's what you get when you go into that browse view. So over on the right hand side, what we're actually looking at is my iCloud drive, demo data, and in here, I have a Pixelmator photo and I've just transferred some images into it. Some of these images, if you've been with me before, you may well remember. As I said, what I tend to do is I've got a couple of images that I edit. They are raw images and they're standard things that I do with it. So if I move down, uh, if we look at that one there with the for sale sign on the back of that lady, which is uh, the one at the top on the left there. I want to see how good the repair tool is. Can it get rid of that label? And if it did, would you see where it was? There's other images that are on there that I use with repair tool, exposure correction, all kinds of stuff. So what I've done is I have actually put those in a folder on iCloud Drive, and that's what we're looking at now. Now, in terms of file formats that it supports, it supports raw files. It supports any raw file format supported by iOS on your iPad. It also supports JPEGs, PNGs, TIFFs, and many other formats. Now, when you open an image, it makes a copy of that image in the Pixelmator photo format, which is .photo. And then any changes you make are saved in that format, that .photo format. So first thing to do is to open an image. Now, as I say, some of these are raw, some aren't. So let's start off with a raw one. Let's start off with a raw one that's really bad, which is uh, this one up here, which was taken on an away day. <laughs> Don't we have good days when we go away here? Um, that was about... Oh, it was alarming o'clock in the morning, about half past five. I don't often see half past five, hence it being a bit dark. But it was taken um, as a raw image. So I thought just shoot it and leave it and deal with it later. You can see at the top it says raw. You'll also see that the file name that I give it, which at that stage was date followed by a number. I'll just tap that so it's disappeared. Um, has a two after it. That's because I've already opened this and edited it once. So that's what we've got on there. Let's bring everything back. Uh, I've just zoomed in there. Come on. Back you come. Where have you gone? I'm trying to bring you back in. You're not having it, are you? Come on. Mm. All right, misbehave. OK, let's come out of it. Let's get rid of that. OK. Start again. Right, there you are and with, with the interface. So that two after it means I've already edited this one. So it's automatically made a second copy for me. Right, before we do anything else, going to have a look at the interface. So on the interface, the first option in the top left hand corner is files. And that will just take you back to the files app that you just come from. Then you have two options, undo and revert. Be very careful with those. Undo obviously allows you to undo. And when you tap on it, you get undo and redo underneath it. Revert will undo everything. So if you do want to get back to the image in the original state it was, revert is your friend and it will do that. But if you just wanted to see the changes you'd made to see that you, you've done them right, then you're not going to be pleased when it completely takes you back and loses all the changes. So be very careful. Then you've got the name in the middle and the fact that it's telling you it's a raw file. And then over on the right hand side, you've got the, a limited range of tools. But what's there is fairly powerful. 
So the first thing you've got is ML with a wand on it. ML means machine learning. So basically what it's going to do is do what it thinks is right with that image based on the learning that it's done on millions of other images. So let's tap that and see what it thinks. Well, at least it looks like it was later in the day and I can see everything on that image. It's not a bad starting point. It's not perfect because it looks kind of washed out. But certainly, if I toggle that off, it's better than that. And I haven't had to do much with it at all, other than just tap the ML. So we're going to have more of a look at that when I've gone through the rest of the uh, tools that we've got up here. But the next tool is the repair tool. It's very, very simple to use. I'm going to go into this in more detail. But if I just zoom in, I've got all this garbage on the floor there. If I just show you just how simple this is to use. You literally just draw over what you don't want anymore and it disappears. So that's the second big tool that we've got there. Then you've got the crop tool. So I'm going to go in and show you more about the crop tool because it does a lot more than you would imagine. But it's there. Now, although I've still got the machine learning option turned on here, if you tap the fourth icon, that takes you into what you might consider to be more of a manual process in terms of um, what you can do to tweak the machine learning part of it. And I'm, I'm being asked a the most important question here. Would I like to be keep, kept up to date with the score? Absolutely, Carl. If United are playing Barcelona, I need to know the score. I need to know what mood Mike's going to be in when he comes home, basically. So feel free in the chat to let me know. So what this does in this view is this is the granular level of control. And again, we'll be looking at that. Then you've got the fifth option, which is to share this image. So imagining that you've done everything you need to do with it, then exporting it back out and sharing it. You also have the dot, dot, dot. And under the dot, 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 you've got lots more information. And that's the first thing I'll be looking at when I've just taken you through one more item, which is at the bottom there. And just in case anybody is interested, historically, historic interest on the replay, we're already losing 1-0. Fabulous. Marvellous. So I can think we can say Mike won't be in the best of moods, but never mind. Right. Along the bottom, when you've gone into this manual level of control with that fourth icon, along the bottom, you get presets. So if you're familiar with oh, a whole range of other image editors, you'll know that they usually provide presets. And that's what you've got in here, presets along the bottom. So again, I'm going to come back and have a look at that in more detail. But you've now got a general overview of the interface. So I'm going to head back to the dot, dot, dot in the very top right hand corner and take you through a couple of the options that you've got available in here. First of all, you can toggle a status bar on and off. Now, the status bar it's talking about is not at the bottom of the window, it's at the top. If you look at the top, you've got, well, basically it's wasting space. It's the time, the date, what your Wi-Fi is, what your battery is. So you can get a little bit of space back by turning that off. You can also choose to auto center the canvas. And obviously at the moment it was in the center, but you can choose to auto center that canvas if you want to. So I would leave that turned on quite handy. Then there's the histogram. Now, if I turn that off, that gives you a little bit more space at the top of the controls on the right hand side. Now, I like to see the histogram. If you weren't sure what the histogram is, it's this in the top. I'll admit a lot of people couldn't explain what it actually did. But if you actually just just look at it and watch it as you work with it, you'll very quickly get an idea of what it's doing. It's basically showing you the representation of colours in your image from the darker ones to the lighter ones. It's as simple as that. And as you make changes in here, so I'll make some hideous changes, you can see what happens with that histogram. So it's a really good way of learning by leaving it turned on. But if you never, ever, ever want to see it, then you can turn it off in there. You can also turn on extended values in here. I'm going to leave that turned off as most people would. But the most important two are the next two. One is the show info. And what this is doing here, and there was no way that was seven minutes past 10. <laughs> Not in the morning, it wasn't. Um, but this is information that comes from 
um, the image itself. So it's the meta information. And the rest of that, I can assure you, is spot on accurate. It was my Canon 30D. That was the lens I had on. Uh, the ISO was 200, etc. So that gives you information about the image itself. So I think that one's quite important. And also the, the Pixelmator Photo Help, which opens up a small help file. Now, you tap in the icon on the top left. doesn't look like there's much there, but it does actually allow you to drill down and gives you a lot more information. So if you have a look about levels, it tells you, it gives you an explanation as you scroll down. It tells you every element within the levels interface. Scroll down some more and it gives you information about how you can use that in various images to get the best out of your image. So there's more there than you would imagine in the help. And what I've done is work through it page by page. I can assure you there's more in there than you would imagine. Some of it is fairly obvious. If you've used any other application like Photoshop, Affinity Photo, Pixelmator on desktop, stuff like the repair tool will be self-evident. So there isn't actually that much information there because it's very hard to go wrong, which is good news. But do find your way around the help. Let's see if that's any, any use to you. And the last option up there will take you out to a browser and it'll take you to the support section. So that's it for the interface. Let's actually get on and, and have a look and do things. Let's do things. Now, there's a couple of gestures you need to be aware of. You'll notice as I'm working through this that I'm tapping. I'm either tapping to turn on, in that case, the repair tool or the crop tool or the manual adjust tools. And you can either do that with your pencil or you can do it, use your finger. You can't quite see that on that video, but I am actually tapping it. There you go. I'm tapping it there. You can also, which we have already seen, seen tap gestures. So if I've got my repair tool and I just tap on that screen, I'm actually repairing it. So I can either tap once if the brush is big enough to cover the area, or I can actually draw on it. And when I draw on it, you see a line on it. Hmm, that's not great. Now I've got two of those. Let's do that the other way. There we go. So that's a single tap. But you'll see if I double tap, it will zoom me out and it will zoom me in. So that's a double tap. Also, if I want to move around, uh, I tend to use two finger gesture. So I'm actually using two fingers on that to move it around. The reason I tend to stick to that is um, if I haven't got a tool selected, one finger will do it. But if I have got a tool selected and I try and do that, look what happens. It's repairing it and that isn't what I want. Luckily, I can undo that. So I tend to always use a two fingered gesture, as it were, to move around in it. Ah, uh, What else have we got? So there's a tap, the double tap uh, and the swipe. Now, there's also another one which is the most useful. You may have found this inadvertently, but I found it advertently because I knew it was there. Right. We've made some changes to that image. Um, it was very dark when we brought it in. But is it an improvement? Well, I'm not quite sure. Remember, I talked about the revert, which will take you back. And I said, be very careful with it because it will undo everything that you've done. But if you just want to temporarily look back at where you were, if you tap and hold. Uh, hang on, I've got the repair tool. I'm not taking my own medicine here, am I? Let me undo that. Right. Without a tool selected, tap and hold and it will show you what the image was like originally. Let go and it takes you back to where you are now. So it's the quickest way to compare where you were with where you are. So those are the most important gestures. And you've also seen me use the pinch, which is the zoom in and zoom out, which is far faster if you just double tap. There we go. So be aware of those. Now, let's have a look at uh, this machine learning business that it's doing. So we'll turn that off and I will make sure that I revert and take that right back to how it was when I very first opened it, which is where it's at now. All right. So uh, when you tap the machine learning, it, it automatically changes that image based on what it thinks is right. Now, it could be that that's good enough for you. On the other hand, maybe it's not. So if I turn that off and tap on the fourth icon, which takes you into the manual adjustments. Down the bottom, I said there were presets and all these things down the bottom are 
these presets. They're like recipes. They are a collection of settings from the right hand side. Just to show you this, I'm going to turn off all of these. So where there's a slider, I'm turning them off. They are all now turned off. Each of these can be turned on individually. And you'll notice that the top five have machine learning settings as well. So if I adjusted the white balance on that and tapped on machine learning, it would have a look at it and make a guess as to what the best thing to do with it was. Now, I'm going to undo that. But these elements over on the right hand side, the settings within them in various configurations are what these are along the bottom of the iPad screen these presets. Now, the presets that you've got, so I take them across, it's like a little thumbnail scroller. All of these presets are grouped into various groups. And I remember the first time I opened this and I looked at it and I thought, oh dear, what do all these letters mean? I mean, obviously BW black and white. After that, I was pretty much lost until I got to C at the end. And I thought, hmm, that's probably custom because there's a plus next to it. And I was right. But all of the others, no, they weren't obvious to me. But really, you don't need to know what they are because you've got the little thumbnail and you can just have a look. So if we tap the first one, it applies it. I go for the second. That's kind of bluer. That's less blue. And literally, you just apply them going through them. And potentially finding one you like. So if you've ever used Instagram, you're good to go. They're pretty much similar to that. But you need to know what they are, don't you? Now, the little colour blocks indicate each section. So you've got the orange, the blue, the kind of goldy colour, the, the lemon. So let me show you a quick, quick tip. If you tap on the actual colour, it tells you what it is. Not only does it tell you what it is in terms of its black and white, but it actually gives you a little bit of a write up that explains how it's best used, what it's actually doing. So it's saying it's a classic black and white film. It's versatile, etc. So it actually gives you a little bit of information. So if you forget what these are, you can always go in here and just tap on the color and it will tell you what they are. So the orange ones are cinematic. So in cinematic to me. So let, let's close the cinematic and go into this one, which is a classic film. They're all much of a muchness as far as I'm concerned, but I'm, I'm glad that it actually tells you what it does. Once I started moving along, some of the others started to make much more sense. So, for instance, it's saying it's explaining that modern analog films, uh, highlighting skin tones, pleasing outdoor shots, unique grain detail. And it explains that. So I would know when it when to use it, basically. So let's come out and have a look at the rest of them. Once I started moving across to LS landscape, that kind of started to make more sense. OK, so this is going to boost the colour and bring out the detail. So make it much more punchy, maybe, than you would want a portrait. So it started to make a lot more sense at that point. Vintage, I've actually used quite a lot on old images that I want them to look older. So it, this is when it really started to make a lot more sense. So do go across and, and check them. Urban was another one that I used because I had some photos of images. So again, it, it, these are settings that would benefit buildings and man-made structures. And I will apply some of these uh, and you'll see what impact it has. And these are the ones from Pixelmator Pro. So if you use Pixelmator Pro on the desktop, and then, of course, you have a custom. And I did make a custom one. You might think, well, how can you make a custom one? Well, it's very simple. Think back to what I said these presets were. They're a saved set of configuration options from the right hand side. So all I did was make my own and tweak it and then tap to the add button to make this, which was my own setting. So that was what I started with. And I wanted it to be much more punchy much more detail on that. So those are the settings at the bottom. Right, I'm going to have a look. I've got a question there. If my camera is capturing both RAW and JPEG, uh, how do I import the RAW to make adjustments? Maybe I should just be quiet and wait. <laughs> no, you don't have to be quiet and wait at all. Not at all. 
one of the issues with this is you've got to get the images onto the iPad somehow. So I demonstrated that you can bring them in, which in fact is quite unusual from cloud services. Now, you can bring them in from your camera roll as well. But if you think about a lot of image editors on the iPad, they're pulling them in from the camera roll. Now, there's a lot of ways that you can get the raw images onto, well, into this application by putting them in a cloud service first and then opening them from there. One thing I think you have to accept is that it's aimed at processing individual photos. It's not intended to be Lightroom for manipulating and managing groups of photos. That's the only caveat with it, I would say. So hopefully that will um, clarify that. Can you rename your saved custom presets? That's a very good question. If I go across to it and I tap and hold. Yes, you can. You've got remove, redefine, rename and share. And I'll show you how to share later. In fact, you know what? I'll show you how to share it now. So let me go in and rename it first. So at the moment, it's just 001. I'll just call it Elaine and rename it. So it appears at the bottom with a name on it. Then tap and hold again, tap share, and it uses the share sheet to share it. So where it can go depends on what you have configured in here. Most people will have save to files available. You'll also see these uh, icons at the top with AirDrop. So I've got another iPad. So that's not sharing it to the iPad I'm working with. I have another iPad over here. And because that one's turned on, um, it's suggesting I share with that. The one in the middle is my iMac. And the one next to that, Novate, is another iMac in another room that's doing another job right now. The middle row is applications. So I have this configured. Uh, Notion is amazing. If you never knew you use Notion, you need to use Notion. It's not a photo editor. It's um. It's hard to explain. It's like a to-do app. Um, but all of that's configurable. So what's in here is the apps that I use the most or the apps I'm most likely to send stuff to. If the app you want to send it to isn't there, then you can tap more and it will give you a list of other applications you have installed that are capable of accepting a file from photo. And you'll see there's an awful lot in here that I don't have turned on. I don't consider I need Box, Drive, Amazon Drive, um, Yoink, because if you remember, I can get to those through the file app. So I don't clutter the send sheet with that kind of stuff. But if what you need to send it to isn't listed, do go and have a look. But at the bottom, we've got save to files, which will save it to the files app. So in my Pixelmator photo, I'm just going to tap on that and click add. And that's it. It's gone away and it's done it. We go and have a look at that in my files app. So up here and it was in demo data and it was in Pixelmator photo. And there it is, my custom setting. So it's got the C from the beginning and it's got the name of it after that and it's saved. I would suggest if you're going to do that, um, that you're going to make custom settings at all, that as soon as you're happy with them, you do export them because, again, they're only going to exist on this iPad. So do have some kind of system set up whereby you export them, maybe within a folder that you have. Uh, do I have one of those in here to show you? Mm, I do in Google Drive, which I told you is my primary one. Uh, in Google Drive, I have an application support folder. And in my application support folder, I have settings for every app that needs them. So if I like tonight, I'm broadcasting with Wirecast and I'm using a configuration setting and that exists in Google Drive. If it was on my local machine, it wouldn't be backed up. All the screenshots I take on my Mac are sent up to Google Drive so that I never lose them. I think there was about 36,000 at the last count, but I have been on a Mac a while. Uh, all my Stepshot guide files are in there, but mainly like Name Mangler, they would be configuration options. Flex time would be configuration options. Um, Affinity assets. So all the stuff that I use inside Affinity is, is all backed up up there. So that's a very good practice. I don't put that in iCloud Drive, mainly because iCloud Drive it doesn't really want you to tinker with it, does it? It wants to create a folder for each individual application and then you put your data in there. That's why I don't have it in there. 
Right, so let's get back in here. So these configurations that we've got, they are settings, they are groups of configuration settings that you can then tinker with more over on the right hand side. Basically, that's it. So I tap through some of these black and white ones. This isn't probably the best image to see the black and white ones, but that is very fast to apply. This is a raw image, remember, I think it's around the 15 meg mark. Uh, it's an old raw image, but it's uh, a raw image and it's that fast to apply them all. Now, if you find one that's not bad, it's not far off what you want, but it's not quite right. So that one's very bluey. I mean, these are landscapes, so they don't work well. Let's get to those urban ones. And I thought the urban ones didn't do a bad job. Uh, that one's not bad. It's just a little bit too dark. So what I can do over on the right hand side is use that preset as a starting point. And then I can go through each grouping here. So in the white balance, I could change the white balance. And I can do that by either sliding this temperature and tint or I can actually choose a grey point in here and it's saying it's chosen that one. But I could actually change that and drag that up. Come on. Um, you can change the hue and saturation at the moment that one's turned off. So the setting that I used in the urban one, the urban 004, isn't using the hue and saturation, but it is using the lightness settings. If I wanted to turn on hue and saturation and saturate it a lot more, I can do that and I can change the hue as well. So now I can. Oh, dear. Not not a good idea to do, but you can see that, you know, that wasn't applied, but now it is. So you can do that with it. So now I've got a lot more blue in it and I've saturated it a lot more in the sky. But originally this UR004 didn't do that. If you look now, that one's not showing you that it's applied because what's applied on the right hand side is now customised. That was my starting point. I've gone in and I've started editing it. Now, obviously, at this point, this is far too dark. So I could go into the lightness and start changing the exposure a bit, bringing that up. And I might want to lighten the shadows a bit. Now we can see that I've got far too much colour on the end there, but never mind. Uh, and I can brighten it up more. So it's starting to look incredibly different now. Can add to the contrast or really take the contrast down. I'll have it a little bit more contrasty. And I can even change the black point. Now, in terms of that histogram, when you're saying you may or may not understand the histogram. At the moment, the black point is almost in the middle. There we go. It's at 0%. Black points in the middle. If you look at that histogram on the left hand side of it, when I take that down, it moves the black point across to the right, meaning we're not seeing as many black pixels. Basically, we're lightening up the black pixels. Now, you may do that um, sort of a CSI situation where you're looking for detail in the dark areas of an image, but you may want to darken it for a special effect if you're using this, if you're processing this to post it. So what you do with this is completely up to you, depending on what it is, your, you know, the ultimate output that you're looking for. And you can have a play around with all of it. So in the colour balance, that's not applied yet either. But if I toggle that on, I can tap the machine learning on that and it can have a rare old think of it and do that with it, which I don't think is the best look I've ever seen. But it's not it, it doesn't look as bad on my iPad. So that's maybe not um, the machine learning on that one. Maybe not. Maybe I want to make some changes and I can do that in here. So if I want that to be a lot cooler, I can drag it down towards the blue and it makes it cooler. I can drag it down towards the cyan and the green. And, and you're really changing the balance of the colour in that image. Now, obviously, it would be highly unlikely you would take it across like I'm doing, um, unless you're looking for a very special effect or turning night into day or something like that. But the good news is you can do it if you want to do it. And you can either do it on the master like that, and you can up the colour in there or take the colour down. So that's basically a saturation over on the left hand side. Or you can do it with three way colour, which is you've got your shadows, your midtones and your highlights. So if you wanted the highlights to have more saturation, then I could bring that in. So if I wanted that sky to be more blue, you can see there's more blue going into that sky. And I drag that down and I've got more blue in the sky than I had before. Let's tap and hold. That's what we started with. That's what we've got now, which looks like a nuclear winter, doesn't it? Not the best look. 
but uh, just showing you what you can actually achieve. Bearing in mind, this is a raw image, so it's not going to come out looking all pixelated. It's working on a raw image. This is the level of control that you have with this. And if you decide, oh, no, I'm going to turn that off, you can just turn it off. When you turn it back on, the settings that you had are still there. You can also use selective colour and work on particular areas of colour, which would probably be better demonstrated with another image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and get another image. That image is being saved right now. So there is no concept of just saving an image. It, it, it's happening itself. So let me show you which one was the starting point. I think it was that one. This was an eye stock image. So this hasn't been touched. It's a JPEG. If I tap the machine learning, it basically makes it a little bit darker. So let me turn that off, turn it back on, brings in a little bit of definition around the girls in the middle. Then I tap the option to get more detailed with it. Now, let's say I wanted to use this in a catalogue and the pink tops and purple shorts a bit too much. Well, you can start playing around with the colour, but one of the most powerful things in here is you can actually replace the colour. So let's first of all have a look at this in here, which is let's get the pink and let's take the saturation right down of the pink. And you can see what's happening in the middle there. Uh, those, those pants on the top, totally different colour. And you take that out. So you've got very, very good control over that. I'm going to take that selective colour back and actually turn it off. Because what I'm interested in is this replace colour here. So I'm going to toggle that on. This is pretty cool. I like this one. Right. What you need to do on the left hand side of it. Well, actually, you can see you've got two eyedroppers and all you need to do is specify what colour you want taken out and what colour you would like to replace it with. And this image is actually quite difficult for that because there's lots of shades of those pinks and purples. But I'm just going to tap on that and drag that across. Let's work down here and pick a sort of lightish pink. We want to replace that with something else. And I'm looking for a kind of khaki look with it. Yeah, probably not that. <laughs> That's a bit garish, isn't it? I want it to look like less girlyish, really, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, more sort of brownish, but not orange. Right, let's leave it like that. I know you're thinking that looks absolutely appalling. It does. But that's because we've got the intensity pushed up to 100. The range is in the middle. The intensity is up to 100. Now, the range determines what pixels are affected. So if I take that down and say the range is zero, nothing's affected. If I take it back up to 100. Everything gets affected and they've turned into minions. Yes. So I think what needs to happen there is down this end. So it's only affecting the clothes that they're wearing. And you can see that actually happen. So about there ish. We don't want the skin included. We just want the clothes. Then on the intensity, if you dial that back, it starts to look far more natural. So now it looks like they were wearing a sort of deepish orange top and brown shorts. So that's not an easy image to change colours on because the it's not a solid block of colour. It's very simple if it's a chair. It's not quite so simple if it's clothes that are moving that have created shadows and creases, but it can actually be done as you've seen. Now the range and intensity is correct. If you go back into the colour to be applied, you can then start playing around. So uh, they look more, more pink with that one or purpley. Or orange. Yeah, that's kind of red, isn't it? Or, or, oh, dear. But you get the idea. So if I choose that orangey one, that's far too intense. But gone, where have we gone? Where have we gone? Replace colour. That's it. And I've lost that there. Never mind. I'll go back and get it. There we go. And we were on orange, weren't we? And what I was suggesting was we make sure that we're affecting only the pixels that we want and changing the intensity so it's not too in your face. So go in here. There we are. That was, that's kind of peachy. Now, you might find, as I'm doing here, that you may need 
to apply a colour that you don't think you would. If you want it peachy, why are you making it brown? Or why are you making it burgundy or green? Because it's the interaction of the two colours, the colour that, that it is and the colour that you're applying on top of it. So it's the interaction that determines what it's actually going to look like. But I think that's incredibly powerful. Now, you'll notice there, one thing this doesn't do is there's no way to select anything. But by choosing a colour range and then altering how much with the range option and then altering the intensity, you don't have to make a selection to apply a change selectively. So it's a whole different ideology and methodology of working. But it's actually easier if you think about it. Not everybody can make selections that precisely. But in here, you don't actually need to. So this is the kind of uh, level of detail that you can get. And you can see in here, there's a whole range of things that you can alter. So if you wanted to make that image black and white, not bad, but very, very light. You might want something far more sinister, in which case you play around with these until you get the look you're looking for. So taking down the red brings back some darkness to it. Taking up the green also does that. Taking down the green kind of makes it lighter. So we'll leave the green up there. Try with the blue, take it down, take it up. And yeah, it looks better up there. And then you can adjust the tone. So if you want it very dark, you can do that. If you want it very light, you can go the other way. We take it down there. They're much more silhouetted and you get an idea. That's the kind of thing you might use on a book cover, something like that. So those are the details that you can change on the right hand side. Now, if that is something that you want as a custom one, I'll slide that across and you can save it as a custom one. Before that, I've got a question here, which is I couldn't find a clarity local contrast slider on the right hand side. Does it have this feature? No, it doesn't. And already there are about five requests for that. So add your name to it. It's not there right now. What is there is extensive, but it's certainly not got everything. No, it hasn't. And that's one of the things it doesn't have, unfortunately. Right. So I want to make a custom setting of that. And all I need to do is have all of these set the way I would like them to be set, which they are. Tap on the plus and that's it. I don't even have to stop to name it. It's saved. But as you've seen, you can rename it. Obviously, try and keep it fairly small. Uh, what I might choose to do with that is maybe that's my preferred black and white settings or maybe black and white dark. OK, and it's renamed and then do what I did before. Now, if you're really happy with that, then do it. Do the share straight away uh, without any further tweaking and get that into Pixelmator photo. And that is backed up. OK, so. That's that's two tools, really. It's the machine learning option that we had, first of all, with the um, wand. And it's the detail in here as well. But you have got a couple of other tools. So let me have a quick look at the questions. Yes, I think they do need to add more features. I think what they've done here is they've gone for something that will, you know, the 80-20 rule. 20% of the features, 80% of people will be happy. Of course, the other 20% who aren't happy are way more vocal. <laughs> and I know I'm usually one of them. Uh, Apple would take that approach with iWork. And I'm in the 20% screaming blue murder. There's no mail merge anymore. And I use that all the time. But they, what they do is they take away features they believe to be niche features. Unfortunately, if they're the features you want, you're not going to be happy. I think there is a lot, a lot of developers and I must admit, I'm one of them as well. I was a developer in my heyday. When I built something, I was in the absolute best place to start again and do it better. But at that point, I've got, you know, 90 percent of the code written and I've got to hack away with it. Um, with code that's probably not optimized. And I think a lot of developers, they sit there and dream of starting a project over, starting a new project with what they know now, with new tools, with better processes, with better workflows. And the problem with that is, and it wasn't acceptable at one point, if you think about when new applications come out, you expect them to have more features than previous ones. When an update comes out, you don't expect features that were already there to be missing. Apple seemed to have popularized that one 
But what they've done with this is gone back to the drawing board and, and basically created the app as it would have been created if we'd never heard of a desktop computer, if an iPad was always it. And obviously there are things going to be missing at this stage. I would imagine that, well, I can tell you now, there's another beta out. I haven't installed it because I wanted to do this session on this version of it, the version that you can get from the App Store. But they are already working on fixes and adding features. So it's just a matter of when your pet feature will be added and hopefully it will be sooner rather than later. So let's go in and have a look at a couple of the other features. So for this one, I'm going to get up. Oh, let's have a look. Let's try something fairly straightforward, which is this image here. It's a beautiful image with hot air balloons. Obviously, that, that image has seen a severe lot of Photoshop already, hasn't it? Um, but you've got these three hot air balloons and they're sort of kind of the focus of the image. But if what you wanted was the lighthouse and le less of the hot air balloons, then you'd be looking to use the repair tool. And the repair tool on this could not be easier. I would say zoom in so you can be quite precise. Enable the repair tool by tapping its icon in the top right hand corner. You only have to do one thing, which is the slider at the bottom. I'd start off in the middle and see what size that actually is and then work away with it. So that's not actually bad. And all you need to do is draw around, well, draw over, get every pixel that you want removed. But notice that what I'm doing here is taking in enough pixels at the edges so it can distinguish what I would like removed. Now, this image isn't as difficult as some other images, obviously, because the background is simple. So it should do a reasonable job, but wow reasonable and it was never there. So let's zoom in on this one and try again. In fact, we have a bit of a dark shadow there. Let's just draw over that. There we go. So let's try this bigger one. And draw around it, give it enough so it can distinguish. So on the left hand side, we've got enough. On the right, we haven't. Uh, given where this iPad is, I'm finding this quite tricky to see. So I'm using my I'm using what you're looking at to check. And that's gone as well. So let's have a look at that. Not bad at all. I think we do need a dirty smudge there getting rid of that dirty smudge there. That's better and possibly a bit there. Right. Let's try and get this big one. Let's get rid of this big one. And again, just draw around it down the bottom. I'm not being as precise as I would be if I was trying to do this for real. But hey, it's a demonstration. There we go. And it was like they were never there. Now, if you do get any dirty smudges, you just want to be sure, then do that. Uh, and it's got rid of. Which I've been doing this probably for 25 years <laughs> Um, and you used to have to make selections and use stamp tools, and it was hideous. This is aimed at people with zero skill in making selections. If you've noticed, it doesn't have a selection tool. It doesn't care. Just draw over it and it will get rid of it. Now, the, as I say, that one was fairly easy um, because the background was not bad. Pretty easy to work with. But how would it go on if the background was a little bit more tricky? So where's my images? I think they've dropped off the end at this point. So I'll have to go browse for them. They were in here. Let's let's try that one. Now, this one's tricky because there's a lot of it, which is that for sale thing. Let's get rid of the string first. Now, I've used this image in about five different applications. And I would say if this works well, um, because you may do this once and think, oh, that was great. Go in and do the same image again and, and like that's not as good. It's an algorithm and it's based precisely on what you select. So if it doesn't work too great, undo it, start again. What I'm going to do here is just draw over that, take it down to there. And what I'm concerned about with that is that the bit in the hair looks OK. And it actually does. That's not too bad at all. Uh, no, I didn't want you to do that. I'm not, not listening to myself again. 
Right, then I need the for sale bit getting rid of. So I might need to up the size of that. And when I'm drawing around this, I've got to remember to get in at the bottom edge, the shadow on it. So make sure that that is included as well. So I want more around the bottom than I do the top and then just let go. And that is better than Snapseed because I've done this in Snapseed and that one is better. Right, I've got a comment here. Find the in-painting tool in Affinity Photo to be more accurate with complex images. That's very true, actually. Um, there's about five different tools for doing that job you've just seen me do in here in Affinity Photo. I tend to always use the complicated one on the basis, although it takes a fraction of a second longer, I'll probably get a better result. Um, but it, it very much depends on the image. One tool might work better on one, one image than another. That tool in here, brilliant, because what's left where the label was looks natural. Sometimes when you do this, you know, you look at it and you think, oh, there's something there. You know, I can see edges and you have to go in and tinker with it. But that was literally draw over the top bit, draw over the bottom bit. It's done. Now, how would it cope with an even more complex image? Well, let's go and have a look again. I've used this one before. Um, and mixed results, to be honest with you, mixed results with this one. We try this bit over here to get rid of that. On the one hand, that's a difficult thing to get rid of. But on the other, maybe not, because my eye could look at that and think, yeah, there's some kind of consistency in the stalks going upwards and the lines in the grass going left to right. So actually, that's not as tricky as you would imagine. Uh, I'll take that down a little bit and I'll just draw around there and then fill in the bit in the middle. So all of that needs getting rid of. And then take away here as much as needed. So be careful with shadows. But basically, that's it and it's gone and you can't tell. Which is better than some apps I've seen even desktop quality apps. So let's go and have a look at the rest of these buildings. Again, it probably looks trickier than the app's going to find it. If you were doing it manually, your biggest job uh, with the stamp tool would be finding a bit to copy from. So just drawing round on the inside and making sure I've got enough round every edge. So taking a little bit more at the top there and try that. Not bad. Now, I found with that one, there was something caught my eye, which is the two trees there look very samey. And you might not notice, but I did. And all I did with that was draw over the bit that's blindingly obvious. And it mixed it up enough that it then doesn't look like a copy of the other tree. And that leaves this outbuilding over here. So just draw around that, taking in exactly what I need and no more which again can't see the top of the iPad there we go I think that's right not bad at all so I think that one was more difficult I've actually done this in Photoshop and Photoshop did not do as good a job as that just did so I think that's the best one I've ever done with that. I have tried getting rid of the tractor a couple of times. That doesn't end well <laughs> because obviously it's it's the main part of the image. Um, but the rest of that, that looks pretty good to me. Again, if you're going to be absolutely pedantic, if you look there, you've got four stalks and they look like copies of each other. So it might be an idea just to get rid of a couple of them. So it doesn't look, that doesn't look too bad now. But that's been picky. That's been really picky. And there's another one over there, isn't there? There we go. So good job. Good job there, I think. Not bad at all. Let's go back and have a look if I've got any more with those. I think I had one more in my brows. Oh, yes. Now a real one. A real image. How does it behave on a real image? Poor child. Poor, poor child. All right. So tool again. Get that the right size. Let's draw around these measles. And it does a very good job and it does a very good job very quickly. 
If you notice that, it's not taking long there to make its mind up what it needs to do. Now, it, this one looks pixelated because the image itself is a low res image. Um, there's a bit over there. Oh, that one at the top. There's one in the hairline there. Now, I'm actually with that one taking quite a wide view on it because there's like a red around it. So I'm including all of that to get the skin tone correct. And I don't need to worry about the skin tone. It will worry about that. Uh, normally, when you do this, you would have to worry about that, especially if you're cloning from one area to another. But with this tool, it takes care of all of that. Now, there's a scratch there as well. So let's take that up there. Made her look like the Joker. And have we got anything else? Possibly a bit there. Oh, no, I think she's OK there. There we go. So it's very fast to do this as well. Um, really, you can't go wrong with that, can you? We've got one down there. And I think I had one more with that. Because I was pushing this. I was thinking, come on, come on, fail me, was what I was thinking. <laughs> and it didn't. <laughs> Darn it. Uh, now, I haven't actually tried it on this one. So let's give it a go. This is the first time I've opened this image in it. I have done this in other applications. And the tricky part of this is leaving in enough grass that you can't see that the bike's gone, which is quite tricky. But let's let's draw it in and see how it does. I have no idea if this is going to end well. Didn't have time to do this one. That's because I was playing with another one. Uh, the other one I was playing with was actually real. It's an image I was doing for real, and it did a brilliant job on that one. So I'm trying to be reasonably careful with this. Because I don't want it to be an unmitigated disaster. Um, obviously, the more time you take, the better the result will be. And if it doesn't work brilliantly, undo it, do it again. Right, that doesn't look bad, does it? Put a tiny little bit more there and see how it does. Oh, wow. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Let's try the, the guy as well. Got rid of the girl, need to get rid of the guy. All right, let's include that around there. Obviously, the bits like the back and around the head, far easier because they're solid edges. Um, if you've got something like that bit between the arm there, where the background is the sky, you don't have to draw over that. You could leave that. Uh, you may find that's problematic. So, again, trial and error until you get used to what the tool can actually do. Uh, make sure I've got all of these bits here and I've got to go sort of into the grass there because the wheel is down there. Right. I'll give that a go. Again, that's amazing. That is amazing because the edges, obviously, against the sky, you think back to what we did with the balloons. The balloons were fine. The balloons were easy. This not so easy. Uh, if you were doing this manually with the old tools in Photoshop from 10 years ago, this would be an all day job. It would be a living nightmare. But that is absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. I know my skyline's amazing. We don't want cyclists in the skyline, do we? So. That works fantastically well. So I can highly recommend the um, repair tool. So if you don't use it for anything else and you've spent your £3.99 or your £4.99, the repair tool's amazing. Right, let's come out of here. Uh, the one I did it on for real. Let me see where I put that. Where did I put that I did it for real bit? It must have been in here somewhere. Did I put it in my demo data? I've got all kinds of rubbish in here. Ah, there's, there's the one I did it on. Now, the thing is, are you the before or the after? There's <laughs> a before and an after in here. Oh, let's try that one. And this was an image I was actually prepping to use, and that's the before. And what I did with it, um, it was taken on an iPhone. So it's not raw. It's just a standard image. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's it as shot. The colours were like that. I needed to use it as a promotional thing. So I used the portrait mode on my iPhone. Hence the background being blurred. So I was quite happy with that. It's not perfect, but not bad. My problem was the desk looked scratched. That table was scratched like crazy. 
you look at it and I thought that's totally ruining it. It took me a little bit of time, but I went through and I did every single scratch and I got rid of every one. And what I ended up with was totally amazing. So I'm taking away little bits of dust there. But if you look at that scratch, I could go very narrow with that and just go across it. No skill required. I can say this because he's not here tonight, but even Mike could do this. <laughs> He'll kill me when he hears that. Um, very, very easy to do. What I ended up with, this bit down here where I've got a reflection, you can see all of the scratches in it. I sat here and I got rid of every single one. I did the big stuff first and then I went through and every scratch that was going in different directions, I redid it. And when I'd finished, it looked amazing. So whether it's big things like you're trying to get rid of a person on a bike or it's small things like this, it's just as good. And uh, what I ended up with, I was very happy with. And uh, so was the person I was doing it for. So, yes, let, let me get rid of that big scratch at the back there, because that was definitely one I got rid of. I got rid of that. And I got rid of that one. I think it took a couple of passes because there's actually more than one scratch there. But I don't have to be that precise. I don't have to be that clever. And it got rid of it. You can't really see them much, but trust me, when you turn that on and off, at the end, you notice the big difference. It's never going to make that table look like uh, something from something worth a million from the Antiques Roadshow, but it will make it look a lot better than it looks right now. Uh, and that's what I did with it in there. Right. OK, let's get out of that one. All right. We need to go back into uh, we need to go up a level. Demo data pixel meter. Right. I've got one in here I use to um, show the next tool, which is, ah, let's get the one of me. I was young, what can I say? That, that needs a couple of repairs as well, if you look here. But it would certainly, this was scanned from an old photo, as you can see. It's not the highest quality one, because uh, that was like 300 meg. But it, it needs a little bit of work. But what I did want to do with that was crop it. So that's what the crop tool does. But the crop tool does a lot more than that. It's not just that. Um, bottom right, left hand corner, it's got the crop icon. Also got a disclosure angle. There's three tools hidden under the crop tool. Crop, straighten, perspective. So we'll look at crop first. As it's a crop tool. That's what the name implies. The next icon lets you pick ratios. So do you want non, the original ratio, square, all kinds of stuff there, or you could do a custom one. Now, actually, I'm not really concerned about that. I just want to crop this down so it's just the image. And I'm quite happy to lose a little bit uh, off the edge. I don't want a border on it at all. So I'll take it off off. So I've not got anything white showing on there. Let's drag that down and drag that up there. And that looks good. And that's it. I'm cropped. No problem. Couldn't be easier, really, could it? Hmm. Let's try something else in here. So we've got that one done. And you can see what's happening. That's the file I opened on the left. and But across even further on the left, it's the dot photo file. And that is saving with the crop. Now, all of the things you've seen me do are non-destructive. So what it's doing, I can actually show you that in a file, but I have to show you on my desktop. Right, looking at the questions. Um, you don't seem to have any control over the file type or quality when it's saved. No, because what it's actually saving is a dot photo file. And that's an internal file format. I will show you how you get that out there uh, shortly. Right. Uh, I assume it keeps the same file type. I would worry about JPEG degrading the more you save and reload, whether it's into the same app or a different one. Uh, right. Now, thing is, it's not degrading that JPEG. It's not actually touching the original image, no matter what file format it is, because the whole thing's non-destructive. Let me take a slight detour here and try and show you that. Oh, where have you opened, you swine? <laughs> uh, I've tried to open a finder window. 
and I've got a sneaking suspicion it's behind my iPad. It would be, wouldn't it? Come on, come on. Where are you? Oh, it's not going to let me show you. Right. What I did was um, it will save that file and then I export it. Well, actually, do you know what? I'll show you. I won't tell you. I will show you when we go into it. So we've done a bit of a crop on that. Let's do a couple of other things and then we'll export some images. So what I'm looking at now is to go in and browse again uh, and we'll have a look at the straighten tool. So uh, what am I leaning across to the keyboard for? Losing my mind, that's why. Right, where's the one with the straighten on it? I think it's that one. I must have been drunk when I took this one, and that's not bad considering I don't drink, but that horizon is not straight. <laughs> it's not straight by any stroke of genius. You'll also notice I've got, that's my Canon 30D from the year dot, I've got some dust on it there. Now, this is one of the things that's very, very simple to fix. You've already seen that. All I need to do is get the repair tool and touch it and it's gone. However, and there's another bit over here somewhere. There it is. Another bit there. So same procedure, just do that. However, it's dust on the lens. If it's dust on the lens, although it's easy to fix in one image, it's going to be in the same place on all the images. Nightmare. That's why an app that can batch process is handy. And that's why something like this is not the app to fix that problem across 200 images taken in a day. But it can fix it on the road when I need to just export this and fix it. So horses for courses. So let's go into the crop tool. This time, I don't want to crop it any more than I need to. I need to straighten it. So I'm going to tap on the button at the lower left hand side and tap on straighten. Now, a lot of the time when you're using a straighten tool, you get to draw a line on it. Not in here. You've got this thing at the bottom where you can drag it one way or the other. If I drag it that way. You can see it straightening it. You get a grid and you can see that that will straighten it. If I go the other way, it makes it worse. But hey, maybe I want something artistic. So I'll drag it that way to straighten it. And as it straightens, and I think that's about right. You can also see that what you're left with in the crop frame is the bit of the image. You're not going to get any white areas. Now, if you think of how Photoshop works with that, you could fill in the gaps. This isn't doing that. It's cropping down the image so you don't have to. But that's about Right, I've now got a straight horizon and I've not lost too much. And I've also dealt with the um, dust on the lens. So it's very simple to use. You don't have to draw a line. You don't actually have to get really involved with it. You don't touch the image. You just touch that thing at the bottom and straighten it or, you know, do an artistic crop of some description you know, or an artistic straighten if that's what you want. And it's that simple to do it. Now, while we're in here, I will show you. Uh, the perspective one, which is with the perspective, it works in a similar way. You have a vertical perspective and a horizontal perspective. So let's try that one. And you can pull it forward going that way, or you can pull it forward on the left hand side by going that way. I actually found the best use for that, uh, obviously for buildings is the best use for that. So that's one way. Uh, let's tip it forward to us at the bottom and tip it forward to us at the top. For, for buildings, that is great. One thing I thought of using it for was I had an image. Let me see if I can find it because I edited it. <laughs> so it must be in here somewhere. It's not in that folder, but it must be here. Uh, probably my demo folder. If I saved it, maybe I didn't. Oh, no, it's not there. No, it's not. OK, what I did was the image I had was of some text. I'd taken a photograph um, of with my iPhone of uh, my Kindle and there was a quote on it and I wanted to tilt it upwards. And you can do that with it. So it works fantastically. When I would use that, 
because obviously I've got desktop apps and I do it on the desktop. But when I'm away, if I want to make a slide and I want to put an image on it and I want to tilt it up a little bit or tilt it down, I would struggle to do that in many other applications. But in here, it's very, very simple. So definitely worth having a look at with that one as well. Now, last thing to have a look at then. All right, let's open some of these images. Oh, I didn't, I didn't show you the other thing, did I? Let's go in and do that. I have no idea why that image is rotated incorrectly. No idea whatsoever. It should be right, shouldn't it? Uh, but what I can do in here is the uh, last one I've got. I should be able to flip that round very simply. Hmm, horizon's off now as well. So then I would go into the straighten and straighten that a bit. Come on. Let's have a look. Is that straighter or am I going the wrong way? No, nope, that's not bad at all. It's straight now as well. So the standard things you might need to do with images on the road, you can do and you can do quickly and easily. The images that you're looking at there, they were taken in Brighton at a beach soccer tournament. <laughs> it was a while ago. I think it was even before I had a Mac. It was the early 2000s and I was in on a press pass. And I was the only idiot using a film camera. Didn't happen the next year, I can assure you, seeing as though the back opened and I lost a couple of images. Um, but that was a situation where I look back and think, wow, I wish I'd had an iPad. I wish I'd been able to deal with those images in real time at that event. What actually happened, if you want the full story, uh, and you can't see that from that image, but it was the Cronenberg Cup, which is a beach soccer tournament. And Eric Cantona was there with the French team and he was in a foul temper. <laughs> the press had upset him and he wouldn't do any interviews. And his teammates wanted um, a team photograph and he was not letting any photographer anywhere near them. He was in the foulest of tempers. Uh, what the press had done was they kept him awake all night outside his hotel room. So he wasn't happy. But he remembered me from the year before when <laughs> this is an even funnier story, but you'll like it. Um, the year before, there were no changing facilities. So they put a curtain up outside the press centre and the press were crawling all over it, trying to get pictures of the French team in the nude. I took my camera off, put the camera cover on it and put it in a safe. And he clocked that I'd done that. So the following year, when his teammates wanted a photograph, he pointed at me and said, only her. And I was shaking like a leaf and all the French team lined up for their team shot. And I took their team shot, the only photo that was taken of the French team during that tournament. And they all wanted photo. They all wanted copies of it the next day. Not digital copies, real printed copies. And I spent the entire night shuffling from my 40 gig card. It was probably 40 meg, actually, um, to my printer, printing them out. And I look back now and think, whoa, I, if only I could have edited that on my iPad first. So when we think of how far we've come, this app is amazing. It might not do everything that you want it to do now, but if you look back just a few years, I wish I'd had something like that. I couldn't crop or edit or anything. I had a laptop that was steam powered with me and a printer that was whirring away all night to print 15 copies of a photo out. And literally, it took an hour and a half for each, each copy. It was a nightmare. You're probably wondering why I didn't go to Boots to have them printed. It was a Sunday and they were shut. Otherwise, I would have done, believe you me. So it's a great app, to be honest with you. It is a very great app. Now, this image is now the right way up. So now I might want to export it. This is the point when you're making a copy that will be in a file format that other applications will be able to read and work with. So to do that, you tap the button top right hand corner, share sheet. Only this time you've got share and the options you've got in here, there's there's three of them. But usually for me, only two are active. And that's because the top one is to modify the original photo in the Photos app if it's come from there. It's dimmed out here because this didn't. It came from iCloud, if you remember. But it will let me at this point save this image to the camera roll if I want to. That's the second option, the middle one. And the bottom option is to export it in one of the supported file formats. 
So let's have a look at that one because, you know, any, anyone can save to photos. It's that simple. It's now saved to photos. So let's go back and have a look at that bottom option, which is export. Tap export. And these are the supported file formats. HEIF, high efficiency image format, is the, um, it's Apple's file format of choice, which is all very well. But unless you've got the beta version of Affinity Photo or Affinity Designer or another application that will actually read it, it will do you no good whatsoever. But that's what it is. The next one's JPEG. We all know about JPEGs. Then PNG, TIFF and Photo. Now, just to show you, if I tap on high efficiency, I then get extra options at the bottom. With high efficiency, you can set a quality. And as I scale this, you'll see the file size at the bottom. So this one isn't actually that big, this, this file, but I said to you it, it wasn't that large. So that's what you can do at the bottom, depending on if the file format supports it. JPEG gives you exactly the same options. So a compromise between quality and file size that you get to control with the slider. PNG doesn't have that, so it just gives you a file size. There's nothing for you to interact with with that one. Nothing for you to interact with with TIFF, nor photo either. So only high efficiency. And I think that was, was that set to 85 originally? Uh, yeah, it, it kind of snaps to 85. So high efficiency and JPEG configurable, other three not configurable. But what I'm going to do is save this as a photo file. Now, a photo file can only be edited in Pixelmator Photo, which isn't great, is it? Uh, because you're exporting it. But what I did manage to do was export it as a photo, take it into another iPad, and edit it on the other iPad. So if you want, you know, if, if you've got two iPads, if like me, you're blessed with multiple iPads. Um, this is the iPad that I did that on. This is yet another iPad here that I did that on. Um, maybe your battery's going and you want to carry on editing and you, you can't swap it. So, so th that's what you could do with it. I'm going to export this as a photo file though, so I can show you what that actually, what the implications of that actually are. And hopefully it will, it will explain to you how the thing is working. So tap next. And now it says where. So again, you've got your airdrops at the top. You've got your apps in the middle and you've got your services at the bottom. I'm going to save this image, which will, which will it should have brought up my files, but never mind. It must have saved it somewhere. <laughs> I will endeavor to find that later. But I also want to export this in other file formats as well. So I'll take it out as a JPEG as well. So let's go on to next from there. And where have you gone? I'm going to print you. I want to save that image. And it's saved that as well. I am wondering where it's putting this. I would have expected to be prompted for that. And should we do one more for good measure? Hopefully we'll be able to find at least one of these. Let's go on to the TIFF one and export that. And save image. Right, so it's saved. Better go and find it now, hadn't I? Hopefully it's somewhere I can find it. Uh, I would like to think uh, it's in it. Well, first, the first thing I'm going to look at is, is it in my demo data? Because that was where it started life, in here. Hmm, let me have a look. I've got my two settings in there. Don't see the other files at all. Right, the next place I would look for it is all these folders are applications that are storing their data in iCloud. So I'd be looking for a Pixelmator one. Aha, Pixelmator photo. There we go. So let's open that. And here's all the images that uh, I've been working on and saving and stuff. So with a bit of luck, they're in there. Uh, of April. Oh, there's that one I was telling you about, uh, the one where I tilted it round. Hopefully they're in there. That's worrying. That's really, really worrying. That is not what it did when I was prepping, I can assure you. Right, what I'm going to do is I want to show you in here um, how Pixelmator Photo works with photos. So uh, give me a second while I attempt to find it. Here we go. Right. I need to find it in iCloud. So I'm looking for the image. So here's iCloud. Let's have a look in, are you alphabetical? 
Let's have a look and see if it has actually put them in here like it would be good if it had. Let's have a look for that. Hmm, interesting. Right, what these are, all of them, is dot photo files. Let's have a look at this. And if we toggle the extension on, you can see they are dot photo files, which means only Pixelmator Photo can edit them. Right, that's the first thing. They are packages. Now, what I actually did was download it to a local folder. So I'm not going to put it on my desktop and I'm not going to put it in documents because I have iCloud desktop and documents turned on. I'm actually going to put it in a, a local folder and I, I don't actually use that many local folders. So uh, hopefully it will save this to a local folder and I'll be able to show you something that happened to me that completely and utterly freaked me out. So I'm going to make a new folder. Uh, I'm just going to leave it set to untitled. So here is my untitled folder. And here is the photo I've just saved. And remember where that is. It's on iCloud. I'm going to drag and drop that. And I'm going to make a copy of it in my untitled folder, which is local. Oh, and like every good demonstration, it's not doing what it did before. That's not good because I wanted to show you. Right. What it did last time was instead of it telling me it was a package, it didn't. It told me it was a folder. Now, I did that by downloading it. So let me see if I can find the original naughty one it did it with. And show you what I found inside it. There it is. So let me get that in local. And let me get that in untitled. Right. Awesome. This was what it did the first time, which helped explain something. That's a dot photo file. And so is that. I downloaded it from my iPad and I thought, why is it a folder? What I was hoping was I'd be able to edit it in Pixelmator. Shall we see if we can open it with? No, it doesn't like it doesn't want to be opened with anything, really, does it? Oh, hang on, it might. Yeah, not app delete. That wouldn't be great, would it? Hmm. Let's have a look if it will open it with Pixelmator. And how I'm doing that is I'm choosing open within Alfred and I'm typing Pixelmator. Pixelmator Pro. Let's have a look. Nope, doesn't like it. So it's only Pixelmator Photo that's going to be able to edit that. But when you see it like this in a folder, you actually get to see what's going on behind the scenes, which may explain to Gary, who was asking about he's concerned about the quality. Let me show you what this what, what is inside a dot photo file. There's two folders, data and quick look. So let's open those. One is the preview of the image. So in this case, that was it. That was the finished product. See, all the scratches have gone. So that's the preview image. There's a thumbnail image and there's an icon. There's some metadata, which is the .info file. And then there's these two files. And these two files are the instruction files. So if we look at the name of this one, it's the set of instructions to apply to this photo if you want to restore it. So basically, it's a set of instructions as everything that's happened to this image. And that is what allows you to revert. So a dot photo file is far more than just a TIFF or a PNG. It's a set of instructions that can be interpreted by Pixelmator Photo. So don't get concerned about the quality of it. When it's a Pixelmator Photo file, repeated saves isn't degrading it. That only happens when you come to actually export it. Now, I have no idea why the first time I downloaded it, it gave me a folder and the second time it worked correctly and it gave me that file. So one one's showing as a folder, one showing as a file. I have no idea why. If I right click on that one, which is a file, it knows it's a package, though, and I can open it and it shows me exactly the same information. So there's my thumbnail and there's my image and there's my icon. It's just that 
my Mac is interpreting one correctly and one not correctly. But hopefully for the more geeky amongst you, you've got some shrewd idea now of what's going on behind the scenes. So you don't have to worry about quality. Right. OK, let's get rid of that and let's head back into here and do a quick recap of everything we've just looked at. Uh, Pixelmator Photo is very concerned with machine learning. It's um, the automation side of it is what it's concerned with. You do have, in relation to machine learning, lots of presets available from groups at the bottom, which could be night settings or landscape or cinematic. Those are the groupings it gives you. Each one of them, go in and have a look at what it tells you. It will give you a very good starting point as to what to expect when you apply that particular look. Also, if you're looking for a particular look, one of these might get you 80% of the way to where you want to be. So if you start off with landscapes, but you would like it a bit more punchy, start with one of the landscapes and then move on. Again, if you want it a vintage thing, but you want it more vintage or slightly less vintage, there's a very good starting point for you. Urban ones work great with buildings. The night ones I've had a look at when it says taken in low light. Well, you saw that with the image that I took. You have access to your Pixelmator Pro settings in those and then Every one of those presets that you apply, you can apply manual adjustments and adjust them and tweak them to how you would like them to be. We also had a look at the repair tool, which is nothing short of amazing. It's the probably the best one I've seen. It's also incredibly tactile because you're on your iPad and you're working with a pencil, not a mouse. So it is very, very good. If you don't use it for anything else, use it for the repair tool. The crop tool does a lot more than just crop. It's crop, flip, rotate, straighten, adjust the perspective. It's not everything you will want to do with an image, but don't be mistaken thinking, well, I don't want to crop it. I'm trying to rotate or I want to straighten it. All of that is hidden away under that crop tool. Then we looked at exporting images. You saw how it could export. You also got a sneaky peek behind the scenes of what, what is inside a dot photo file. And that's why you don't need to worry about the quality. But what's missing? What, what couldn't I show you? Because it's just not there. Well, you didn't hear me talking about brushes and choosing brushes and choosing quality and choosing hardness and then trying to do something magic with it because there's just no brushes. There were no layers. You might not have noticed, but there were no layers. That's because it's non-destructive and we didn't need them. There's no masks. But again, you saw me edit the colour of the shirt and the shorts on the two girls. And I didn't need a mask to do that. I did it via colour. There's no gradients. And I could go on and on. There were no vignettes. There's a lot that's not there. But what is there does work incredibly well. And what I would say is it's four ninety nine. Go and buy it. <laughs> if only you play with it and you work out, well, that's not there and that's not there. Tell them it's not there. Tell them why it's important, why you think it should be added. Um, I pre-ordered. It was three ninety nine on pre-order. It's now fully available. It's four ninety nine. Um, it is a lot less expensive than you may have expected, because to be honest, what you were expecting was maybe Pixelmator for desktop on your iPad or Pixelmator Pro on your iPad. And it's not that. So it's much more akin to something like Snapseed or Polar. It's for photos. If you think of it in terms of editing an individual photo and making that single photo look the best it can on an iPad, that's what it does. And it does that incredibly well. Uh, so that's it for Pixelmator Photo. I'm back again in two days. So if you've enjoyed that and you'd like some more techie geeky fun, I'm back on Friday. I do a show called MacBytes After Hours and I do lots of demonstrations of applications. Um, this week's going to be a special one because it's my anniversary. Mine and Mike's anniversary. So we're having an online party as well. And in terms of people who might be here watching because it's Pixelmator photo, one of the things we're intending to cover, which Graham requested, so get your requests in, we cover requests, is sourcing free vector artwork. 
And I thought about it when he said it, and I thought, well, basically, that's just a list of sites, isn't it? And as I thought about it, I thought, actually, you know, it's not. So that's going to be quite a, a decent piece. It's not going to be a two-minute thing. It's not going to be just a list of sites to go and get them. Uh, I'll be talking about where to get the best ones, what you can do with them and how best to deploy them. So feel free to join us for that one. Uh, it's an hour later start than this one was. We go live at, at nine o'clock, but that's in two days time. But that's it for Pixelmator Photo. I hope that that, that has been useful. I hope you found it enjoyable. Um, and I hope to hear from you. Uh, if you are if you've missed any of that or you would like to see it again, you could always find it on youtube.com slash Elaine Giles, which is my channel. Uh, and lots of live events you'll find on there as well. So if you hit that subscribe button, you'll be notified when we go live. For the moment, thank you very much for being with me. As I say, I hope you found that useful. Um, we're about to head off into Q&A. What we do after the main session is I take questions from you and provide answers. Now, depending on, on how far off piste we go, I'll tend to leave these questions and answers in or maybe take them away. If they're not there and you're interested, contact me. If they are there, feel free to carry on and enjoy. But if what you wanted was a demonstration and that's it, you're not interested in the Q&A, then that's it. And hopefully I'll see you guys next time.